This is Bay Radio. Here today, we're going to be chatting with Dr. Margaret Livingston. Hello, hello, Doug. How are you? I'm good, I'm good. How are you coping with uh, current situations? Well, um, I I find it fascinating. I I just was working in London the last couple of weeks and I managed to just get back to Spain last Thursday. I think I, you know, was very lucky to get back into Spain um, because now the flights have just been uh, stopped. So I'm, I'm feeling very privileged to be... Uh, living in the countryside in the peace and quiet, but I realise there's a lot of confusion and worry out there about this virus, coronavirus. Mm, mm. Now you're a, you're a doctor of immunology, right? Yes, yes. So your your finger is right on the pulse, so to speak. Yeah, well, basically my background, I, I studied immunology at university in Glasgow many years ago, and um, I then did a PhD in haematology in um, cancer research. And um, yesterday the government were talking talking after the COBRA meeting in the UK and they were talking about people that would, would be at high risk for um, getting this infection of coronavirus. COVID-19 is the actual disease that you get from the virus. And um, they were talking about people with multiple myeloma, which is what I did my PhD in. So it's just anybody that's, uh, that is immunocompromised, so they have a poor or weakened immune system, is at high risk of catching the virus. And um, and anybody above the age of 65, they're saying, but it's more people who are in their 70s, people who have comorbidities. So basically anybody who has a chronic illness, it doesn't really matter what age they are. So if you're between, um, if you're between zero and 20 years old, you actually have a very, very small chance of catching the virus because it, it's, it does not tend to affect infect uh, young people or babies although there has been some reported cases and there was a baby born with coronavirus in west london um a few days ago um or a week ago and but the baby had an infected mother and so it was obviously pretty expected that it would actually catch the virus but it, it it's to do with the way the virus attaches to the dna uh, in order to infect the cells of host and we are hosts for the virus so if you're under 20 you're very unlikely to get this infection which is good because flu and other major um, infections tend to be indiscriminate in terms of who they infect so if you're between 20 and 50 um, most likely if you're healthy you won't you will have very very mild symptoms from the disease Um, but if you have uh, any other chronic illnesses for instance uh, anything to do with lung disease um, like COAD. So if you've got chronic obstructive airways diseases or if you've got fibrosis of the lung or any weakness in your lungs, um, then then you're more at risk of catching COVID-19. And second most um, worrying second disease to have uh, would be if you were immunocompromised. So if you have uh, any form of illness which makes you uh, have a weakened immune system so that would include uh, people with cancer and people on cytotoxic therapy for cancer or rheumatoid arthritis they sometimes get given cytotoxic drugs so they weaken your immune system and um, also people with autoimmune disease so that's people who whose immune system is kind of turned turned on itself and um, these people would be very high risk to catch this disease and so anything uh, so also people who are malnourished or don't eat a good diet you tend to have a strong immune system if you live a healthy lifestyle if you eat fruit and vegetables and you have adequate vitamins and minerals um, and if you have enough sleep enough rest and you're not too stressed out stress uh, can cause a dampened immune system as well. Mm. So people with uh, with any issues in their immune system or their lungs would be very, very high risk no matter what age they are of catching coronavirus. Um, so if you're under 50 and you're pretty healthy, then you should be absolutely fine and just experience mild symptoms and then you would recover completely from the disease. It, the, the, the figures are roughly that 80% of people will just have mild symptoms and 20% of people would require hospitalization. 5% of those would end up in intensive care requiring ventilation and intensive medical assistance 
and those are the ones that we really would need to worry about. Mm. What would you suggest people do if they feel these symptoms and they feel they are going down with it? What's the best thing they can do? So let's just say that you suddenly find yourself with a temperature. Now, the temperature is quite interesting because if you have a bacterial infection, um, you have a, you tend to have quite a high temperature, maybe over 38 degrees, up to 39 or more. And viral infections don't tend to give you such a high temperature, although they, they can be very, very um, dangerous infections to have, as we've seen. So 37.8 degrees centigrade is is the average temperature that people with coronavirus infection would, would have. That would be the first thing. Second thing would be the onset of a dry cough. Now, if I would describe what a dry cough is, it's just some like a cough which is non-productive, something tickling that's bothering you, but not just the odd cough. You would need to have this cough for several hours, uh, more than half a day is what the experts are basically saying. So you'd be persistently coughing all morning and your temperature's going up to 37.8. And the third symptom would be tiredness. So extreme fatigue is related to this infection. And um, you might just feel a wee bit tired or you know, just feel like staying in your bed, just a bit out of sorts. And and those would be the symptoms of a mild infection of coronavirus. Um, and if you had extreme fatigue, where you literally couldn't get out of bed, you couldn't get to the toilet without help, um, and you just literally couldn't be bothered getting dressed or eating, then you would really need to seek some medical help, maybe go to the hospital and definitely call the help numbers that, that are being circulated on the Facebook groups uh, around this area. Um, some other uncommon symptoms that people might get um, are headache. Now, I've heard of um, a gentleman in the UK who had a headache and a temperature. He didn't have a cough. So if you've got that, I would say, yes, you might well have the virus. So it's not, you know, it's not set in stone. People are different and they don't all the symptoms. They might have a combination. But the common symptoms are a temperature of 37.8, a dry cough lasting more than half a day and tiredness. Um, uncommon symptoms would be a headache, a really sore head, nasal congestion with coughing, a sore throat, um, you may or may not cough up sputum, but it's not usual to cough up sputum because it's it's usually bacterial infection that cause sputum. And this is a viral respiratory infection that we're talking about. Um, you could get shortness of breath. So shortness of breath is not a common symptom. And if you are short, short of breath, then you've probably got a more serious reaction to the virus. And I definitely, definitely would seek medical assistance if you've got shortness of breath. And also if you've got chills, and sore muscles, so a bit like flu where you feel shivery and you get sore muscles, that's a bit more more of a symptom. So I would be checking that out in terms of getting a bit of medical advice, whether you should be getting tested or maybe going to the doctors or the hospital. And sometimes, rarely, you can get nausea and vomiting, but that's not a common symptom. And very rarely is diarrhea. And this is what I find amusing because it's a respiratory viral infection. So I don't understand why people are bulk buying toilet paper. Um, I, I just think it's strange, strange human nature. Uh, people follow each other and copy each other, but you don't need extra toilet rolls. And um, if you have a severe hospitalization case, then you would have a really high fever. You would have coughing and you would be coughing up blood. Mm -hmm. And um, you could, uh, once your blood was tested, you would have decreased white blood cell count. So you'd have an obvious immune response on the go. And you would um, you could possibly end up with kidney failure. So basically, the the very very serious cases, the five percent that end up in intensive care, they would end up needing uh, multi organ support. So they would need uh, fluids intravenously. They would need help with their breathing. And what has actually happened to these people is that the immune response has become so switched on that they sometimes get an uh, an acute inflammatory response which can actually be the cause of death as opposed to the, the virus itself so the immune system is struggling to try and help save you but if you're compromised by being a bit older and your immune system is obviously a bit weaker when you're older or uh, and or that you've got some other underlying conditions then your immune system just can't really cope and these are the severe cases that we have to watch out for to get back to the original point, if you have mild symptoms, you can just self-isolate and self-isolate the members of your family that live with you in your home. That's what the 
UK government have been advocating over since yesterday. So basically, if you've got symptoms, you shouldn't be going outside and um, you shouldn't be mixing, although we've already been put in lockdown here in Spain anyway. But the thing is, you, you don't want to be mixing with other people. So even the people that you live with should be taking protective measures. They shouldn't be kissing and hugging you. They should um, maybe be sleeping or living in di different parts of the house. You should have your own cutlery and um, do your own cooking and dishes if you possibly can and have your own toilet facilities. And obviously you need to have these cleaned um, very, very thoroughly with gloves and um, possibly masks, although I don't really believe that masks are, they're not, the, the ordinary paper masks are not a major deterrent against viral infections. Anyway, what you would do, you would do whatever you would do for a normal viral or flu type illness. You would have rest, um, you would drink plenty of water, you would have warm drinks, you would have analgesia. And there are some reports that uh, non-sterile anti-inflammatory drugs like brufen and naproxen it may actually uh, be counterproductive and I would suggest that on that basis just take something like paracetamol, mm -hmm. uh, some simple analgesia and maybe some warm soup if somebody's kind enough to make it for you or bring it into the house um, and just keep yourself warm and um, you should get better if you've got a mild case of the disease you tend to only be sick for two to three to four days um, and then you should feel much much better and, and the, the hope is that you will have lasting immunity to this infection from there. I think it's important for people to understand how they catch the infection. So basically the, the virus itself, the actual virus which causes coronavirus disease is a respiratory virus. It's called severe acute respiratory syndrome coronavirus. Now the, the word corona is basically a description of the the shape of the virus it's got some spikes around the outside and if you look at that in a kind of uh, distant picture it looks like a halo and it's it corona means crown and mm. therefore that's why it's called coronavirus and um it's 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 new so this virus this specific coronavirus of the SARS type has never been seen before and that's why people have been quite frightened because there's no cure for it there's no antibodies there's no vaccination yet um, so what I would like to just cover quickly is how do, how do people catch it? So as I said, it's a respiratory infection and it's spread from one person to another via respiratory droplets. So when we talk um, or when we cough or when we sneeze, we actually produce water vapour from our lungs in our breath, which could easily contain the virus. OK, so the virus would be it's absolutely minute. It's about. 0.1 microns in diameter. It's absolutely minute. Viruses are tiny. They tend to, uh, they would be in mucus or water droplets coming out of your lungs from coughing, from sneezing, um, and even from talking. And that's why distancing yourself um, from for at least one to two meters from other people is going to help you 100% not to get, catch any droplets. Now the droplets need to land somewhere that you can then ingest them okay so somebody could cough directly into your face and you could just breathe that in and then you would end up with that virus particle in your lungs when you breathe in that's going to your trachea and down into your lungs and the virus will then take hold because that's where it wants to go that's where it thrives that's where it can multiply so viruses can't live on their own they need a host uh, like a, a human being for them to multiply and replicate. Okay? And the other way that you could pick up the infection is that these droplets, it's to somebody next to you maybe sneezes or coughs um, or the, and they've, they've maybe put their hand up, they've got the virus on their hand, okay? And they then put their hand on a doorknob or a handrail of um, a staircase that mm. you're walking up. Now, these are called fomites. These are inanimate objects that that uh, can hold on to microorganisms and pass on the infection. Now, it's been studied how long this coronavirus can actually live outside a human host. And believe it or believe it not, it can live for between four and seven days on a doorknob. Mm without being destroyed, it's still viable. And so therefore, 
you could just put your hand on that doorknob and then at that point you don't have the infection until you put your hand to your mouth okay so you've got to get the virus into your mouth or your nose or your eyes so this is why your whole face is is the vulnerable area any mucosal surface which is a, a route of entry into your uh, lungs is going to be vulnerable so your nose goes straight your breathing goes straight into your lungs you breathe through your mouth so that goes straight to your lungs and believe it or not you can get the virus through rubbing your eyes if you had the virus on your hands and mm. um, so you need to be very very careful about touching things and that's why now at the supermarkets here in spain they're offering you gloves when you walk into the supermarket because if you use the cat you know the pin machine then lots and lots of people are using the same thing and that's where you could pick it up as well um, and so th that's the main root of infection. Does that make sense? Mm, absolutely. Um, there's just one more thing that I need to uh, need to ask you. Now, there's been uh, all sorts of different ideas as to whether or not this virus can be passed from pets to people and vice versa. Yeah. Now, yeah. I speak on behalf of uh, dog lovers and well, pet lovers everywhere. Surely, if uh, if you're if you're with your pet, you happen to have it. The temptation to give your pet a cuddle is it? Do you have yep. to treat them like another member of the family and give them a bit of distance? Um, can we? Well, it's interesting. Yeah, it's interesting because basically they did find um, a family. Uh, they, they, this family um, were positive for the virus. I think it was in Hong Kong, actually. Yeah, I think you're right. And yeah. the dog was found to be positive for the virus as well. Yeah, it's very mild. Eight. Very mild signs, wasn't it? I think. Yeah. So the, the dog had no symptoms, but the point of this is. Who gave who the virus? Right. So the point the point is that the virus, uh, the, the preferred host is obviously humans because mm. it wouldn't be spreading like wildfire in amongst humans if it was more interested in dogs. Okay, it would be it would be you know attaching to dogs and getting spread through the dog world. So dogs could pick up the virus, but it could well be that the virus doesn't replicate in dogs and cats and mm. um, it's supposed to have originated from a bat uh, it's a bat virus that the SARS virus tends to originate from bats and um, and then that would be an intermediary host so we are the we are the final host and the virus would go via an intermediary host so there'll be the bat and then some kind of animal was in the middle um, which was passing on the infection to humans okay so I I was reading about what you should do and um, it's basically the same thing if you've positive for COVID-19 everybody in the house should kind of self-isolate so I would say you can't stick your dog out in the garden and just leave them there for two weeks or a Ooh, week or no. something I would say and it's absolutely human nature to want to cuddle and stroke our dogs you mm. know and, and my take on it having two Rhodesian Ridgebacks myself I, I totally adore them and um, I cuddle them all the time and you know, I, I obviously don't let them lick me. I don't let them lie on my bed. You know, just general, normal precautions. But I, I don't think dogs are going to be a major threat to you. I think you just need to avoid contacting other humans. Mm. All right. Well, thanks ever so much for uh, coming on and chatting with us, answering a few questions for us. Did you notice, though, I didn't open with Dr. Livingston, I presume? <laughs> I, I bet you get that all the time. Uh, there's no E in Livingston, um, and David Livingston, the explorer, he actually was a ton and not a stone. Ah. So he's a Livingston, um, but everybody misspelt his name all the time, and so in the end, he just allowed himself to be uh, a stone, so Livingston with an E. Uh -huh. And I actually come from Glasgow, and he came from Blantyre, which is really close. And I, I was born in Africa, so um, my mother my mother did mention once that um, she thought we might be related, but my dad died really young when, when he was 36, so I don't know. I don't, I've never looked it up, but maybe one day <laughs> I'll find out if I'm related to him. And Doug, can I just say um, that my website is called uh, Mind sanctuary uk.com yep so it's m-i-n-d-s-a-n-c-t-u-a-r-y uk.com and my email address is info at mindsanctuaryuk.com mm -hmm. and and if people would like to have a free copy of my fact sheet which i've put together explaining all about what we've been talking about and a lot more and mm -hmm. um, please could you email me and i'd be more than happy to connect with you and also, I, I am an online consultant. So apart from being a doctor of immunology, I'm actually an advanced nurse practitioner. 
which is called an ANP. I don't know if, if the listeners have heard of that, but it's a, it's a new, fairly new qualification in the UK. And it's a, we are advanced nurses, so we are licensed to prescribe medication. We are licensed to assess um, illnesses and diagnose problems that people may have in their mental health. Uh, so I am a psychotherapist, so mental and physical health. And uh, I'm an online consultant here, based here um, in Spain, but also I deal with clients in the UK. So if MD wants a private consultation about any kind of illness or health problem, please get in touch and I'd be more than happy to have a chat with you. Absolutely marvellous. Thanks ever so much again uh, for chatting with us, uh, Margot. Thanks uh, a lot. Bye. Stay well. I will. We you go. too.